You know, I always think about this every time after we get started, but I should have hold music queued up oh. and getting started fun music. And I never think about that until the second after it's too late to do it. So if any of you want to sing. I was going to say, I'm trying to think <laughs> if there's a song we can sing together. <laughs> you know, for our valuability celebrations on our campus, they do the, is it celebration? Oh, yeah. Is it, yeah. <laughs> a good one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. Their music and the celebrations, yeah. right? You just go into the Zoom room and we go. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> now, I want to keep people on this call, so I don't want to start singing myself, but anybody else is welcome to. <laughs> we're, not, we're live? Yes, we are live. People can hear yeah, us. Live. <laughs> and so for those that are coming in right now, we're going to get started about two minutes after the hour. We're just going to give people time to come in and get settled, and then we'll get started with the actual panel discussion. And sorry, we won't be singing for you. <laughs> Just when I was going to unmute and start. So. <laughs> oh, sorry. I can I can redact that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Linda, so I know up here, I know in North Texas, it got rather chilly last night. Are you experiencing the cold, too? Yes, cold for South Texas. Yes, yes. yes. It was uh, when I left for work this morning, it was 37 degrees. So yeah. that's pretty chilly for us. We did get a rain yesterday, which we really, really, really needed. So that was good. But um, yeah, we woke up today to sun, but chilly temperatures for sure. <laughs> yeah, it was the exact same here. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, climate change. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was so for those that are currently on the call, um, Linda is down in San Antonio and several of the rest of us, in fact, everybody except for Mirabel are um, in North Texas. So we all woke up to 37 degrees today, which is rather chilly for this area. But I know that has to come with an asterisk because people that are in any place that doesn't have a region and that includes the word South in it um, probably think that that's rather warm for this time of year. Yeah. Yeah. My sister is in Iowa, so I can't complain yeah. about the weather in the winter ever. <laughs> yeah. 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 But they are used to it, right? I mean, that's the well, issue, right? Yeah. I don't know. I grew up in central Illinois and I never got used to being cold all the time. So <laughs> you can deal with it, but you don't really get used to it. I think you just learn how to deal with it. So, no, yes. the call, yeah. I always say I'll take winter in South Texas over winter pretty much anywhere else. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, I come from New Jersey in West Virginia and I'm like thinking, okay. <laughs> but then you <laughs> quite get used to the weather, warm weather very quickly. And 37 feels chilly, but maybe if I were in New Jersey or West Virginia, I would have never felt 37 is chilly. <laughs> yeah, especially when the sun's out in late January, 37 degrees and sunny in central Illinois or in the St. Louis area was like, oh, we'll go out in a t-shirt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not so, so much here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I see everyone coming into the call. Uh, I just want to give everyone time to come in and get settled. So we're going to get started about two minutes after the hour. So uh, we will get started momentarily. But until then, yeah, we're chatting about the weather. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's no music. Yeah. yeah, that's to make up for no music. I'm sorry yeah, about that. No music. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have a music for NRM? Do you have music? Uh, like, no, there is no designated. We we need to do that though. That needs yeah, to be need on to. our to do list. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think we would we probably need to find. I mean, there are plenty of um, free songs out there that we could yeah, right. we need definitely to utilize. Song that's, yeah, yeah. Is there a song about mentoring? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty <laughs> sure there is a song about mentoring. There yeah. is a song about <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my my favorite mentoring song is. <laughs> lean on me uh, and i believe yeah. it's by bill withers i, I think but it, yeah. i love that song yeah we'll have to see if that's um has free licensing yeah, yeah. that would be good 
or if we can get permission from him, maybe yes, he'll write like, us back. Uh, it would probably uh, be around fifty thousand dollars to do that. Um, what is it? Licensing. Are you his agent? <laughs> oh no, I just know a lot about. I know. I'm uh, just that. kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> maybe we can put out a special request. Okay. There you go. <laughs> no, we will sing ourselves. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't worry. There's no time for music now because it's time to get started. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, all right, everyone. Welcome to uh, the our, our panel discussion. So in honor of National Mentoring Month, the National Research Mentoring Network and AIM Ahead are presenting Mentors as Culture Creators, Fostering Inclusion and Belonging Through the Mentoring Relationship. So hello, everyone. My name is Katie Stinson, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. But before we dive in, I'm going to go over some light housekeeping, and then I'll introduce all of our panelists. So as oh, I hope you all can see, we are recording this webinar, and it will be posted and shared through both the NRMN and the Aim Ahead YouTube channels once we've had a time to get it downloaded and record and edited and everything. Uh, we do encourage audience participation. We are going to have a panelist discussion between our three panelists for about the first 45 minutes using questions that were submitted whenever you all registered. And then toward the last 15-ish or so minutes, we're going to open it up to uh, any questions that you put into the Q&A. So what we ask is that if you have questions for our panelists while we're going through all of this and while they're already going to be responding to your questions, uh, please use the Q&A function. If you have any technical questions, uh, please use the webinar chat, and then we will also use that to distribute links and things as we're going throughout the presentation today. Um, but then also, if you would like to speak when it, we open it up to the audience for questions, please just raise your hand and we can actually come in and unmute you and invite you to chat. So, and then just what we ask is while you're listening, while you are participating, while you are unmuted, if you would like to do that at the end, just make sure that you're listening with an open mind and you're speaking with courtesy to everyone. You're being respectful for everyone on the call. And then we just ask that you all, all everyone, let me restart that. It's an important one, so I need to say it properly. Please give everyone the opportunity to be heard. All right, so now I'm gonna dive into our panelists. All right, so we have three today. Our first panelist is Dr. Maribel Fernandez-Paul. 25 years ago, Maribel arrived in the US with the goal of developing a career in career research in the field of biochemistry. Since then, her career has taken many turns and thanks to great advice from several mentors at crucial junctures along the way, she found her way to student affairs in 2008. Along the way, she learned the value of a research background, had a publication from her master's research, and was working on a book chapter on her doctoral research. Since the beginning of her career in student affairs, mentoring has been an important part of her career growth and contributors to the peer mentorship and mentorship of future generations of leaders. She is especially interested in mentorship of students who are members of groups that are historically marginalized. In 2017, she co-founded a pathway program called DREAM, or diversity recognized, emphasized, and assimilated into medicine that is meant to empower and prepare students to consider physician careers, especially students who are members of groups that are historically marginalized. Since then, DREAM has written grants and presented data gathered in this parallel longitudinal research study at national, state, and local levels. She is also the founder, or I'm sorry, she also founded the White Coats for Black Lives Matter for Western University of Health Sciences, and in partnership with student leaders of this chapter, can continue to mentor future leaders and agents of change. Having an administrative role in both student affairs and diversity, equity, and inclusion, she finds herself at a unique intersection that allows for wide and extensive support of student doctors on the margins. Since 2019, she has served as a consultant to the National Research Mentoring Network that provides researchers across all career stages in the biomedical, behavioral, clinical, and social sciences through mentorship and programming with a DEI lens or DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. She has led webinars and hosted training modules for mentors and mentees all over the country under this program. So our next present or panelist is Dr. Usha Sambamorthy. Dr. Sambamorthy is a health economist who has dedicated her teaching, mentoring, and research efforts to improving population health by reducing health disparities by gender, race, ethnicity, age, disability, and mental health. In recognition of her commitment to diversity, education, scholarship, and research, Dr. Sambra Morthy received the 2018 Women in Science and Health Advanced Career Excellence Award from West Virginia University. 
Dr. Simba Morthy is one of the few scientists who is applying machine learning methods, excuse me, applying machine learning methods to health outcomes research in an emerging area. Dr. Simba Morthy has published many articles on interpretable machine learning methods to predicting health outcomes. She uses natural language processing and text mining to conduct machine assisted systematic literature reviews. Dr. Simba Morthy's mentorship skills are well known and she is often referred to as mentor extraordinaire by her mentees. Her mentees have included a graduate students, postdocs, junior faculty, and clinicians from different health professions. She has received outstanding mentoring awards from the American Public Health Association, WVU Vice President's Award, WVU Health Sciences, and WVU Distinction and Graduate Research Mentoring Award in 2020. Dr. Simba Morthy's research focuses on improving population health through examination of disparities, health equity, and healthcare access, quality, and outcomes using real-world large data. Dr. Samba Morthy has over 230 collaborative publications and peer-reviewed high-impact journals. She uses diverse national and international databases for analysis and triangulization of research findings. Dr. Samba Morthy has experience in analyzing large national survey databases, health insurance claims, electronic health records, and linked disease registries with claims and BHA administrative data to answer timely healthcare delivery and policy questions. All right, and last but not least, our third panelist is Dr. Linda Solis. Dr. Linda Grace Solis, PhD, is an assistant professor of applied humanities at the University of Incarnate Word School of Osteopathic Medicine in San Antonio, Texas. She is dedicated to education, particularly in the undergraduate medical education setting, where she encourages learning learners to become holistic, open-minded, and culturally and socially aware physicians. Dr. Solis is also passionate about opening doors for individuals who are considered underrepresented in medicine, mentoring these individuals into and through medical school, residency, and physicianhood. Dr. Solis is also a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant, working with organizations desiring to increase their constitutional diversity and create more inclusive and equitable culture. Dr. Solis holds a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in higher education administration, and earned her PhD in leadership studies at Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio. She is honored to serve in volunteer leadership roles for several national and local organizations, including the Council on Diversity and Equity at the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine and the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio Commission. She also serves on the Leadership Council of Travis Park Church and on the Board of Directors for the National Healthcare Diversity Council. Dr. Solis is married to Dr. Felis Solis III. She is an avid reader of both fiction and nonfiction and believes that all books are improved with, with the addition of cats, coffee, and chocolate. And I have to say, I think that is common ground between all of us here. So I am pleased to let that be our intro into our very first question. So let's give a warm round of applause, I guess from your own spaces in front of your Zoom for all of our panelists here as I introduce our first question, which is why do you believe that mentoring is important? All right, so would you prefer for one of you to speak up or would you like me to popcorn around and call on you? Whichever you prefer. All right, Usha, you spoke first. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right. Um, so I think, you know, um, to me, mentoring is part of life, right? So it doesn't even occur to me that it is like um, why I, I need to even think about why it is important, right? It's integral to whatever I do, whether it is a teaching or a research or administrative roles, right? And I think mentoring opens to me pathways, collaborations, networking, and uh, even like, you know, opens your horizons. And I also feel that, you know, in mentoring, you have a two-way relationship. You learn as much as you give, right? And then you kind of like, you know, um, know a lot about a lot of topics because your mentees have diverse interests and, and you also have diverse, mentors also have diverse interests. And I think, you know, anything you do collaboratively is fun. I don't like any to do anything alone. <laughs> so I think the mentorship becomes very important to me because of that collaborative culture. And mentorship also leads to building a community. I have a community of people because of the 
mentor mentee relationship over my career. Awesome. Thank you for that, Usha. What about Linda? What do you have to contribute to that? Uh, Kitty, really quickly, is the sound working? There's someone... I saw that. Um, there is someone that said they cannot hear anything. So I just put a question into the chat. Um, and I want to just hear if other people have, cannot hear. Um, Veronica, I can hear or I can see you. I'm going to allow you to do a talk. I'm so sorry. Right. That was that was a mistake. I was trying to oh. find the chat. Oh, perfect. Okay. I'm seeing other people say they can hear. Okay. Good. <laughs> perfect. All right. If there are any technical issues or anybody that can't hear going forward, if you'll put it into the chat, uh, Jojo Navarro actually is going to be our, um, oh, it's disabled. Oh, well, let me fix that. Um, let's see. All right, everyone should be able to chat now. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, so if anybody has any technical issues or anything, if you'll put that into the chat, Jojo will be able to jump on that. So awesome. Thank you, everyone. So yeah, so I'll jump in here. Um, Osha, thank you for, for your comments. I completely agree. As you were talking, I was thinking one of the beauties of mentoring is that it is a relationship. And like you, I find I learn so much through my mentoring relationships, even when I'm the mentor, right? Um, and that's that's really, really wonderful. And one reason why um, mentoring relationships are so important. Um, I also think that it's important to acknowledge that there are, um, that it's okay to have like lots of mentors doing different things in different times in your life, right? So I'm not a clinician, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a science researcher, um, but what I am is a cheerleader and an advocate and an ally. Um, and so that's what I bring to the mentoring relationships that I have with medical students is I'm just there to be a sounding board, to remind them that like, listen, you are worthy, you got here, you got into medical school, you should be here, you're doing the right things, you can do this. Um, I can also help them navigate any, um, if they're feeling any kind of um, bias or bigotry or anything like that, um, then I can help them sort of navigate that and figure out how do we have those conversations um, with people who are the boss or something like that, right? So, so that's kind of the role that I bring to mentoring. And I think that is that kind of mentoring is important right alongside content, um, subject matter, expertise kind of mentoring. Wonderful. Thank you for that explanation. And just dive into your perspectives on mentoring. All right, so Mirabelle, what is your, why do you believe that mentoring is important? So everything uh, what Usha and Linda have shared, um, for me, I feel like, you know, there's many ways to learn about life. Not everything comes from a textbook. Um, they, we have a lot of textbooks and now we have a lot of uh, roadmaps on the internet. But I think that what mentoring provides is that unsaid, knowledge, unwritten knowledge that we've acquired, that generations have acquired. <clears throat> and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be from the same field. Linda is, you know, having worked with Linda for a long time, you know, it doesn't have to come with uh, degrees attached to your name that you should have in common. I think that um, there's, there's a vast amount of knowledge that people gather just living their lives and creating their own roadmap. And if I, as a mentee, am advised and advancing through my roadmap and I can learn a little from theirs and learn about <clears throat> decision-making, about the forks in the road, you know, be warned about some of the items that are coming my way. And then in turn, as if I can pass that on to the generations that come after me um, and they can learn from my life experiences, um, I think that's the, those, you don't get those in textbooks and you can't, uh, you know, put them on a on a PowerPoint. Those are things that are to be shared and um, passed on from sitting across from each other, drinking coffee or dinner, or in times of crisis um, with tears and hugs and you know um, those kinds of conversations. So I think mentoring has been has saved me many times uh, from insanity, from giving up, and 
from those lessons, I've learned how to be a good mentor to others and provide that sense of encouragement that both Linda and Usha talked about. Um, yeah, we don't have apprenticeships that people used to have generations before. Um, and I see mentorship a lot like an apprentice, but but apprenticeship for life and how to, how to win life. So that's my answer. Awesome. Thank you for that. I mean, all three of you have such unique perspectives on this, but they all have the same themes for really just trying to be accepting of what the person is in need of and who that person is and really just encouraging their own personal growth. So I really appreciate all of that. Thank you. Um, let's dive a little deeper now. So let's hear from each of you. How can mentors increase their cultural competency to mentor people with different backgrounds? Ooh, I'll take that <laughs> one if that's all right, my panelists. Yeah. Um, so rather than focusing cultural on cultural competency, I think about focusing on cultural humility. Um, cultural competency to me sounds like we should know everything about everybody's culture, and that is just impossible. It's impossible. I always say, you know, I've been married to my um, husband for nearly 20 years, and he grew up in the Rio Grande Valley, um, Mexican American. I'm not cultural, I'm not competent in his culture, and I've known him and been in that culture for 20 years, and I can't say that I'm competent in it, right? And so I think this idea of cultural competency to me is completely overwhelming. Cultural humility, I can handle. I can be humble in general. I can ensure that I don't make assumptions or stereotype regarding other people's cultures. Um, I can listen deeply. I can be open-minded. Um, you know, the, the students that I mentor uh, are usually people of color um, or LGBTQ plus or both, all of the above. Um, we don't necessarily share a culture, a social or um, uh, a, a social culture at all, but by being open-minded and um, generally just loving them for who they are and wanting the best for them, um, I can still mentor them. Uh, an example of that is I always, when a mentee comes to me and says that they're struggling on say a rotation during third year, they're having a really, really hard time. There's a certain preceptor that seems to be treating them differently, some kind of way. Um, I can hear them out without putting up defenses. I can uh, believe them when they tell me about their lived experiences, even though I've never lived through something like that, I can believe them when they tell me about it and support them. And, and again, just remind them that like, you got this, right? Like, like you, you can do this. Let's figure out solutions. Let's figure out how to protect you, what we can do. Um, so, so I take it beyond cultural competency and take it into this idea of cultural uh, humility uh, as a way to sort of mentor across differences. I love that. That is amazing. Um, all right, Usha or Maribel, who would like to go next? I can go. <clears throat> so I come from uh, India, long time back, like about 35 years back. So I'm aware of the differences. I'm aware, of, like I have been in the others receiving end as well, right? So I am very, very conscious of being culturally aware. Um, because I think it's very important, you know, um, my students come from all over the world, right? They, my my mind is in general. It's not from one part of the world, right? So you, I have like, you know, mentees coming from Saudi Arabia, completely different culture, right? And you think about women's rights and all of those things, we take it for granted, but they come from that world where they are not given those rights. So I'm always aware of that. Um, you know, so I make myself, the, I go the extra mile to make sure that I am aware of their culture so that, you know, you, you want them to be comfortable. You don't want them to think that, oh my God, I am from this country and they are from this country. And, you know, I really don't know their culture. So I'm saying the right, wrong thing. You know, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And I don't want them to walk on eggshells all the time around, right? So for me, cultural awareness is very important, right? And also the thinking, the you have to, it has to be integral in a person that, you know, people are different. 
and you are you should not be judging them for who they are and you should not be judging them for what, where they have come from and you know it's just like you know we don't have control over our birth no one has right so it's just like you know we all it's a random chance that i was born in india probably and there is a random chance somebody is born in like you know uh, somewhere else so to me that cultural awareness and making sure that you know i'm comfortable with various culture you know people coming from various culture religion what have you anything you know beliefs and all is very important so i always make sure that you know when in the mentoring relationship however it is i am the mentee and you know i am the mentor it's very important for me to always always be aware of that cultural differences and respect that not just be aware of the differences and respect it wonderful thank you for that isha that's very insightful for really working with the different cultures and things that you've experienced so far all right, Maribel, what would you like to add? Uh, I don't know if I can add anything <laughs> more helpful. This is so beautifully said. The only thing I can think of just, um, and maybe it's already said, but yes, humility, I think, in all these relationships have to be the foundational, um, the foundation of our relationships. Um, the reason I think mentorship is so unique, it's a unique relationship from others, is because there is really no outcome or goal we're shooting for in general. Like if you're a teacher, you know, it's related to grades and it's related to the, the student's understanding of the material. If you're a parent, you know, it's it's a different relationship. It's all outcome-based. If um, you're a coach in, in an athletic scenario, you want to see your athlete do well. I think it's so relieving to be in a mentoring relationship with your mentee because um, it's mutually beneficial. And, uh, you know, when you walk into this, this relationship, feeling like you're a learner too, you're going to be in a situation where it's not, you're not, it's not an, you know, it's not a one-sided relationship where you are imparting knowledge in someone and you think they need to live life a certain way. And, you know, because you've been at that fork in the road before you think you should be, you know, they should be doing what you would have done or you wish you would have done. Um, I think that the mentoring relationships are so mutually beneficial that uh, it's best to keep an open mind and to see yourself as a co-learner, you know, on that journey. And so that goes along with both what Usha and Linda said was humility. If you can, um, most mentoring relationships succeed because both people feel like they are not just getting something out of the relationship, but also giving um, and contributing to each other's growth and learning. So I would say, yes, uh, it is it, it is about humility. It's about respect, compassion, um, and also a desire to learn. Well said, Mirabella. I think, you know, fundamental to the mentoring, regardless of whether you are a mentee or a mentor, is that humility in relationships. And always being a co-learner, you emphasize that. That's very good. I think we always need to remember that we are co-learners here. It's not that I am at a very high level and I'm imparting all the knowledge to you. It's like it's like a two-way street or multi-way street, whatever yeah. you want to call it. And we are all here to learn every day. I, I, I think learning never stops. I learn every day. And I was told by somebody who is working in neurology that every time you get a new idea or you learn something new, you get a neuron in your brain. So it's very important for me to have more neurons in my brain so that I can delay the onset of Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, you know, seeing this mentoring process as like the co-learning process as well as, as a process in humility is very, very, very fundamental, I think. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I love that mentoring is so multifaceted. It's beneficial for everyone all around and builds neurons. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So the title of this webinar is all about fostering inclusion and belonging. So this next question is all about that and that theme. So how do you know if your mentee feels like they truly belong? And this can be belong in their setting, feels like they feel comfortable in what they're trying to accomplish, all of that kind of thing. So 
how would you answer that? Uh, is it okay if I go first? Go for yes. Okay. Um, so the way I feel like my mentee is, is feeling like they belong, part of belonging is the sense of safety, right? See, feeling like your voice matters, feeling like you can take some risks in the conversation, feeling like you can push um, that edge of growth and someone's comfort zone. Um, when I'm in those kinds of relationships and, and interactions with um, my, most of my mentoring is with our students. To me, when a student challenges me, disagrees with me, um, you know, uh, says to me, have you thought of this? Or, you know, some way in which they see themselves as uh, not so much of just at the receiving end, but also in a way that they can feel safe to take those risks. To me, that tells me that they have they have gotten to a point where uh, they feel comfortable to take those risks with me and that they belong. Uh, because we are really at our best when we are sitting at that at that fine line of uh, just a little bit of discomfort, but at the same time, you're feeling like you're growing. You have an idea and uh, the idea that pops into your head actually is not in complete uh, congruency with what your mentor has said to you. So you feel like you can you can verbalize it. That to me is the point where I feel like, okay, we're, we're at a point now where we are in an actual relationship where we're moving forward and um, they're, they're, you know, the, the wheels are turning in their brain. So to me, that is a, a form of, you know, a way I can tell they belong. The other way I can tell that they belong is when they reach out to me and say, uh, when are we meeting next? Or, you know, I have something that I need to run by you. Or um, it's when students start to disappear and, and ghosts, so to speak, to use the language of um, this generation. It's when I, I take that as a sign, there's something here that needs to be tweaked um, and that they're not feeling like, uh, you know, that sense of ownership in the relationship. Yeah. To me, I think, you know, it takes a little longer to like figure out, right? Some mentees click right away. There is like a chemistry and you go, you know, hit the road running. With some, it takes a little bit longer to get used to the style, to get used to the personality, to get, you know, to even open up. And as um, you said, I think, you know, you know that the mentee is comfortable with you and mentee feels safe with you is when they reach out to you and discuss challenges, not their successes, when they discuss challenges with you and say, you know, I am really having a tough time with this, right? What can I do and how can I help? It is not necessarily that they are coming to you because you can help, but they, come, they are coming to you because you may have a resource that you can refer them to, or you may be able to help, you know, the mentor may be able to help them out. or you may just like completely, you know, come out and say like, forget about all of this thing, take a breather, right? And let's re regroup after a few days or a after a few weeks. You know, it's when, when the mentee approaches me with, for solving their challenges, that is when I know that they are comfortable and that is when I know that they are safe with me. So they are able to, you know, relate to the, you know, like relate to the relationship and also make sure that, you know, they approach a person who can solve their problems. It doesn't have to be anything to do with these studies. It can be even like, you know, other problems that they are facing. It's because, you know, in my view, when you take on a mentoring relationship, it's just not about the academics or it's not about the project. And you take on the whole, you know, um, multi facets of that person, whatever challenges they are facing in life you take that on as well and you share that as well so for me when that happens I know that you know they are in a safe place and they are trusting me and then they value the relationship and then now I know that I can let them go thank yeah. you yeah thank you both and um, the only thing I'll add is you know um I think one thing that we think about when we think about a mentoring relationship is there's a lot of people think of it as like a power, like there's a power differential and there, there probably is right. And a, a perceived power differential, right? Because the mentor tends to be senior, more experienced uh, than the mentee. So to me, I know that a, a mentee is really like, 
loving the mentoring process and relationship when we're able to sort of break through that power differential or those power differentials, whether they're social or cultural or whatever it may be. Um, and yes, that's when, um, to both y'all's point, that's when the mentee can start to challenge us and that's good for us. Um, you know, we don't want to be set in our ways, right? We want to be able to be uh, mentally um, flexible and, and able to look at things outside of our own lens. And so I think when we get to a point where the mentee is comfortable challenging us, we're breaking through those power perceived power differentials. And that's when that belonging really happens. That is all wonderful. Thank you for that. It sounds like just kind of synthesizing what you're all saying is that whenever you're able to break through to that space of vulnerability is whenever you really feel that sense of belonging there. And that's when you can really tell that Mindy is feeling that. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so this next question, this is really coming from the space of, you know, all of you, I'm sure, have your own ideas about what your university could do or what other things could do or what wide scale things could do to really improve and help those that are going through the STEM fields, especially those that are historically underrepresented. So if you had your own magic wand, how would you recommend that universities could help minority or underrepresented students become more successful and stay in the STEM fields through their career? My first thought when I read that question was that strong undergraduate advising is critical, specifically STEM or STEAM advising, advisors who, um, who have been in the field or who have done research in the field, something like that, so that they can really, um, so that they, they really can, you know, say this is, this is what I think your path should be and really just stay in touch with those undergraduates through the entire four years, advising them along the way. Um, I think also in that advising center, it's important if there is a, a dream in my dream world, right? A STEAM uh, um, advising center that is inclusive um, to all students that the advisors are able to set aside their preconceived notions um, or societal, societally sort of enforced notions of what a doctor looks like, what a scientist looks like, right? Um, and uh, so that every student that walks in, the advisors look at that student, no matter what that student looks like or who they are, they say, hey, you look like you could be a doctor, a researcher, a scientist, right? Without falling into those cultural stereotypes um, or that societal status quo that tells us that like, Doctors, doctors are always white males, right? Um, so I think for me, that strong undergraduate advising, inclusive undergraduate advising is really, really um, important in, in when it comes to keeping um, students from marginalized communities in the STEM fields. Excellent, thank you for that. All right, it looks like Mirabelle unmuted. Um, as you as you heard in my introduction, this is this was a big thing for me a few years ago. It still is, but finally a few years ago, I decided that something had to be done about it. And I probably was one of many people that had the answer. So um we were doing research to see um what was you know basically data of BIPOC students that were choosing healthcare careers, but in particular, uh, physician careers at the time. Um, and we saw that there was just this tremendous, um, very, very scarce pipeline. I remember seeing this piece of data and I, I had to do a double take and I thought that's not right. But then I read it and I asked people. So um, there were more black men in 1970 that were choosing careers, choosing to go to medical school than in 2000. 18 or whenever I started this 17 when we started the dream program um, there were there were times when I would look at data and see a single digit number or a double digit number like 10 about Native American groups and I think oh there's a percentage next to it there was no percentage next to it it was just very very scarce number of students young people in Native American groups and in uh, black African group black African American groups that were choosing uh, medicine 
and I use the word choice as if it's all their choice, you know, we, so we started to do the analysis and see how far do we need to go to get students interested and not just interested, but see themselves as at, in these careers and then sustain and nurture them in those careers, because it's not enough for us to just attract BIPOC students into these fields. We have to sustain their success um, because we're almost working against environments that they didn't have when they were growing up and their white counterparts or um, other counterparts did. So it feels like the more research that I read about how do we support students to choose careers in the STEM field, we almost have to go back to elementary school um, you know, in terms of it isn't enough to go to an undergraduate institution, because that's what I tried first is let me go to the undergraduate institutions around our university and get them to think about medicine. It wasn't enough because there too, there was a scarcity. So then you talk about high schools. Um, our college, our university is actually engaging at the kindergarten level. We are bringing in, we have something called um, uh, mini medical school where we bring in students from kindergarten, put them in white coats and let them play with, um, you know, cl a cloth uh, uh, organs and anatomy sets and things like that. So they can start seeing themselves at that age, no matter what is going on at home, no matter what is going on in their school, no matter what the behavioral issues are, is we can keep showing them that they can be what they want to be, even if they don't have mentors even if they don't have role models. Um, I think that's the investment that our culture, our society has to make if we want to make um, healthcare careers something that all children and all young people can aspire to. Yeah. Oh my God, what, can, what more can I say? So, but Katie asked me if I had a magic wand, right? So I'm going to put on my magic wand now, right? And my magic wand will be, as you said, right? Most of the time, what happens is the education is so expensive, undergraduate education. People take loans or people have to sacrifice something. Parents have to sacrifice something. So if I, I had a wand, I would probably take the equity approach and then remove all the obstacles, that are in their way to enroll in a STEM career, right? That may start from kindergarten, as Mirabella said, and that may be the undergraduate level. But I think, you know, we have to be thinking upstream, not downstream. The upstream is like, even when the child is born, right? Even when they are going to kindergarten or uh, middle school or high school, we need to make sure that they have all the access to the resources because most of the time is even in schools, they don't have the resources. I know, I, you know, I, in New Jersey, we have like this vast differences in resources between schools. You come to the Southern New Jersey, Marlboro Township and all, they have like fantastic labs, computers and libraries, public libraries and everything. But you go to Newark, Patterson, no. Even, you know, it's very, very difficult to find a public library with all the resources and all. So if I had a magic wand, that is where I would start. I would start leveling the access to education to everyone. And I think, you know, that would go a long way in terms of like encouraging students, right? Because as um, Mirabella said, there, we, we are talking about a choice, but there is really no choice. Many of them don't really have a choice. All I can do is only this, or I have to work and then save the money and then go to school. But you know, then I'm so tired after all of these things. And then do I want to spend seven years, like, you know, having more and more debts on the education? So they just like drop off. So if I had a magic wand, it will be level playing field for everyone. Yeah. I wanted to mention, I wanted to throw out some kudos to a dear friend of mine who's a kindergarten teacher, and she just won a grant um, for her program, uh, STEAM Education for Kindergartners. And so she has an after-school program that she and four other kindergarten teachers do um, where they bring little, the little kids come in, five-year-olds, five years old, seriously, come in, and they start talking about like, 
engineering, but in language that a five-year-old can understand. They're doing things with the medical schools in town, right? Like, and and you, like you said, Mirabel bringing in, um, they use those little squishy hearts and lungs and all of that. And I mean, so yeah, kindergarten's not too young. It's not too early. It's not too early to start children thinking this way and thinking about the possibilities that are out there for them. So I just want to give a shout out to her. She's in an underrepresented um, underserved district here in San Antonio, and, and she and her co-teachers are doing amazing things. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, congratulations to that teacher. But my point is that she had to write a grant. Yes. Do this. Yeah. So it is a lot of work on her part because I know that, you know, in some of the school districts that I have seen in New Jersey, the teachers spend money out of their pocket to do these things. So, so why is it only their responsibility? Don't we have as a society as a responsibility so that, you know, this doesn't happen? So I think that is where I think that, you know, we need to provide the resources. We should not be asking people to do more and more and more and more just to provide basic resources. I like that. And I also want to know, so these, these squishy body parts, um, are these stress toys that regular people can buy and maybe then also donate to? Yeah. Yes. And, I mean, keep one for myself too, but also. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you yeah. can buy them. Yeah, you can buy them on Amazon. I think that's where we get it. It really is, um, it's, it's a foundation. The foundation is Velcro. And then you, uh, each body part, like the lungs or the heart, you know, has the other part of the Velcro on it. So you can, they can pull things out. They can, you know, see how, um, the size compared to uh, the other body parts. Like I remember uh, one of the kindergartners that were here, you know, she said, I thought this was all floating everywhere. You know, like, you know, the, the concept that all of the organs fit together and it, it's a contained space, little things like that. I think, um, you know, that we can start, start sowing the seed in, in, their, in their little brains. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead, Usha. Yeah, I was like thinking, like, I don't remember the, game name I think it was operation or surgery yeah. do you remember that yeah. my kids used to have fun with it because if you go like slightly about like have a red light that means you know it's you, you have cut an important part of the body yeah. <laughs> I don't remember the board game I mean I don't see such games anymore but but I also I'm not in the same space now right my children are grown up so things like that you know you can like make it as part of their learning process would be great but again to make that as part of learning process you need resources right you cannot be asking a kindergarten teacher go and write a grant because writing a grant involves a lot of steps competition and rejections and you know reviews and all of that right so instead of spending all their time you know going after these resources what if we give them the resources then we can do wonders right so um, so i'm i'm preaching to the choir yes Thank you. 100% yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally agree <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you all for your insights on that and just ideas. Maybe just even saying it out loud here will help it resonate somewhere else and get started somewhere. So thank you for that. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. We have someone who submitted a question into the Q&A, and I'd like to answer their question. So this states, as my academic advisor's first doctoral student, I think she is still learning how to be a mentor. How can I provide feedback as a student to her that she is not creating a safe space or providing the resources I need? Given the power differential, I'm not sure the best way to provide feedback. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one because yes, there is a power differential there for sure. Um, so I think when I have to have difficult conversations, um, I always, visualize the conversation first of all and I visualize myself I always think of it as walking gently into that conversation I know that I need to have the conversation I need to ask the question but I don't want to harm the relationship so I think very carefully about how I'm going to word that question how I'm going to sort of uh, manage that conversation in order to um, keep that relationship positive and healthy um, while still getting what 
I need. Um, so it takes a lot of pre-planning, a lot of thought, and best to do it before you get so frustrated in the situation that you're just like ready to burst, right? Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to navigate, right? And I think, you know, I agree with Linda that, you know, if you just approach it gently, it will work. Sometimes it just helps to say that, you know, maybe, you know, I work better this way, maybe, you know, give some suggestions in terms of, you know, what works for you, right? And the power differential, I don't know, I mean, in my view, at least the mentor mentee should not have any power differentiate at all, but that's an ideal world. But we live in a practical world and sometimes this happens. So maybe not think about the power differential because sometimes what happens is if you think that, you know, this person has power over me, then that also becomes a self-defeating thing as well. So maybe you can approach by saying that, okay, I work better, you know, so can we talk about how to make this relationship very successful, right? So approach it where you can talk to the person and saying that, you know, you are looking for a successful, not that it's not successful already, but improving that, right? Where we can go. So maybe couch it in terms of improving it and making sure that, you know, that you are looking for, you know, ways that, you know, you can accommodate and at the same time, send the message across that, you know, there needs to be a flexibility. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. <laughs> I think what makes, what is standing out to me in this question is, this is an academic advisor. This is a doctoral student that has a clear outcome. They need this person to mentor and advise them for, in order for them to, have a stellar dissertation, to have good research, to have that, you know, to achieve that degree. So it's a little time sensitive, but it's also, in a way, I feel like it might be easier to manage this conversation than a general open-ended mentorship, right? So so like both Linda and uh, Usha have said, um, you, you don't, you're, you're just like we, we were talking about earlier, a mentor should not, should be coming into this with humility about it's a two-way learning process. I would say, make the assumption that this mentor is trying to learn. She's trying her level best to learn and she doesn't know how to do this. And maybe in this relationship, it's starting with, maybe you're mentoring her to be you know, that mentor. So, so in the end, I think that if this is handled well with humility, with the assumption that everyone is coming to, into this with, with good intentions to learn and be better, um, uh, and that they're not put on the defensive, um, I think this can go really well and can be a start of a really good advisor uh, who's trying to find her way in. You can't go to school and learn to be a mentor and advisor. Nobody writes, you know, writes a course that you can take. You're learning as you go. <clears throat> and so this is an opportunity, I think, where uh, there'll be learning happening on both ends. Um, the only thing I, you know, Linda talked about um, envisioning herself um, having that conversation for me when um, I want to anticipate and and I know this is a delicate conversation and and um, you want it to go in the right direction um, I have three or four three bullet points but you always start with positive you always start with appreciating the person about how they and what they've done and and mean that authentically you know um, uh, so find things that are working for you, find the fact that, you know, she's still in it, this is her first time and she's trying to start positive, and then um, share with her, you know, what, what are the alternatives that you are proposing that can work for you, that maybe won't work for someone else, but in, for, in order for you to get closer to your dissertation and your graduation, this is what you need. And, um, you know, if it goes well, I think this is the beginning of a lifelong relationship and a friendship. So, yeah, it's a great point, um, Mirabella, that, you know, you start with the positives always because to hear criticism, it stings, right, to anyone. So you don't want to be, you know, like put the other person on the defensive, but always start with the thing. It has worked very well so far. But, you know, what if, what if we change this? 
may we change this you know and see what happens there you know kind of like you know having a flexible approach would also help something so i had been working on a sociology degree for a while and something that they always talk about in that when you're doing social science research not to come in with assumptions but to come in asking okay there is this behavior that's occurring can you tell me why you're doing this and it could be that they are completely unaware that they're acting in a way that's making you uncomfortable or making a situation more difficult than it needs to be or it could be they have a reason behind it but either way you're coming from a point of understanding and then saying oh i understand why you're doing that you know for me i'm feeling it this way and this is my perception of it so can we figure out a way to work together on this so that's something that you know I, it even it doesn't matter if you're talking about politics and it's heated discussions because it's across the aisle it like when you come in from a question of just wanting to learn why somebody is doing what they're doing and just coming from that open space and creating that dialogue it makes it a lot easier to then make suggestions or to ask questions about well do you think it could be better done this way or do you think you could try this scenario instead or this approach instead so i don't know your exact situation but i've seen it in multiple times we're just approaching it with an open mind and your own humility going into it too can be really beneficial so i know you're all the experts but i just wanted to add that in no no well said Gaddy. So. Yeah. well well said yeah so we are getting close to time, but there is one last question that I think is going to be a perfect way to wrap this up. So I really want to hear this from all of you. All right. So what is something that someone has told you at some point in your life that you have never forgotten? I know it's going to be a little bit of a hard one. <laughs> uh, persistence. I think, you know, whenever I'm like, you know, was upset with failures and upset with like, you know, something didn't work. The one advice that has resonated with me is persistence. It doesn't matter if you fall, get up. It doesn't matter if something gets rejected. It's, it's fine, right? You will have other places to go. And that has always, you know, um, been with me. And the other one that, you know, I always remember is don't worry about one door closing. There is always an another opportunity for you that will happen. And it has happened to me personally as well. When one door has closed, I have always like, you know, gone after, you know, I have always thought about what can I do? And then it has opened other opportunities for me. So these are the two things, persist and don't worry one about one door closing. Um. Linda, I'll jump in here because what I was going to say connects with what Usha just said. I think my favorite saying, what I learned a long time ago, was everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And, um, you know, I, it took a long time for me to truly understand what that meant, but it's exactly what Usha was saying. Is, um, you know, when you set out, have have big goal, big picture goals. So it's, you know, you're if you think you want to have a career in, in healthcare, keep that as a as a goal. Now, now uh, for me specifically here, we have medical students. We get med I get medical students, and the first day of orientation, they'll tell me, "I want to be a neurosurgeon," or "I want to be this cardiologist." You know, they're very specific about what they want to do. And my my um, advice to them always has been: keep an open mind. You know, you want to land somewhere uh, to be a good physician whatever that takes, and you want to have a, a you know, work-life balance, you want to feel good about uh, what you're doing. Um, and so, so two things to go along with that is what Usha said was persistence, but have, uh, have a positive persistence. Know that you, know, you may have met, um, there may be a wall, there may be something that happened that looks like failure to you, but maybe when you go back to your second attempt, Maybe use some creativity. Think about, you know, is this, um, how can I get to my goal maybe in a different way? Who can I work with? Who can, you know, is, a, is there a mentor out there that can help me? Uh, don't give up. Um, you know, life, life presents opportunities in all kinds of ways. I can tell you, I would never would have known um, that I, I would have graduated. Uh, now, I believe we've graduated more than uh, 
more than 700 medical students, there are 700 physicians out there that I have invested my life in, you know, that will know me my first name. Uh, hopefully someday if I'm ever in an ER or if, you know, I need a new knee or a new hip, that it would be one of the students, you know, one of my mentees that, uh, you know, I was in their life. So, and there was a time in my life where I was in, in my teens and I thought, I want to be a physician. And this is so much, you know, that didn't happen for me. But uh, when I think back, if I were to tell myself, I didn't get to be a physician, but I'm invested in hundreds and thousands by the time my career is over, physician lives, um, I would never have thought that, you know, I those doors would have opened, like, like Usha said. Um, so you never know what life presents to you. Um, if it's not okay, it's not the end. So keep going. I love that. Uh, Maribel, I think the same thing too. I think about all the um, student doctors that I've worked with over the decade or so that I've been in medical education. And it really is astounding. And I am at the point in my life, I've graduated enough students that now and then I end up in a hospital with my mom or something. And one of the physicians is says, Dr. Solis, do you remember me? I'm like, okay, you were like, you know, a thousand students ago, but yeah, <laughs> it is wonderful. Um, I, for me, there's two things, both um, really, the first one comes from my mom and my mom is just, she's 92 years old and is just a light in this world. And she always reminds me when I get frustrated with work, with life in general, she always says, just, you know, just remember that everyone around you at work, especially they're doing their very best. They are doing their very best that day. Just assume that about everyone that you come in contact with. And remember too, that sometimes their best that day may not be a hundred percent, but they're still doing their best. And if you give them that grace, they'll give you that grace as well. And I will never forget that. It just is something that just is in my heart and is try. it's how I try <laughs> to live my life. Some days it's aspirational. <laughs> um, and then the other one from my parents, um, is this idea of just like, if something's ahead of you that's intimidating or overwhelming, just start, right? I'll tell you a story. So I grew up um, out in the country and one of my chores as a kid was to clean out the chicken coop. It's a disgusting job. I don't know if any of you have ever kept chickens, but they're gross and they're smelly and they're gross. And I always say, I never feel guilty eating chicken because they're gross and they're not very smart. And frankly, they taste better than they look. But anyway, so so one of my jobs as a kid was to clean out the chicken coop every week. And it was a horrible job. And I'd put it off and I'd put it off and I'd put it off. And mom and dad, one or the other of them would always say, look, you could be done in an hour. If you just get out there and get started, it'll be done and you won't have to worry about it for a week. Um, and, and so that has stuck with me my entire life. If there's something that you're dreading, there is no good at all in procrastinating and putting it off. Just dive in, get started, get it done. And, and so I think that goes along kind of with Usha and Mirabelle's persistence, right? You, you got to start before you can finish. And so that's one of my sort of lessons that I try to share with people, especially in times of life when they're struggling um, at whether it's at school or with a possible promotion, whatever it may be. I think every restaurant needs to rename their chicken dish as Linda's Revenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing they're delicious because yeah. otherwise there is like no use for them at all. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I feel like the dish needs to be a, you know, a chicken breast with a poached egg or something on top of it. And that can really be your real revenge. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, we are at time. I want to go ahead and share just one last slide I have. Um, just thank you all to our presenters for or our panelists for coming in. Um, again, this was Mentors as Culture Creators, Fostering Inclusion and Belonging Through the Mentoring Relationship. And you all did such a wonderful job. I know we weren't able to get through that many questions, but I think that really speaks to how wonderful our panelists were. So thank you all for your insights and just everything that you provided today. 
If anyone would like to keep the conversation going, both Linda and Maribel are members of my NRMN and Usha is a member of Aim Ahead Connect. And you are welcome to utilize the QR codes or the links that are on the screen. And I will add the QR code, or I'm sorry, the links into the chat as well. Um, and we definitely invite you to join the networks and keep in touch with everyone and continue the conversation. So thank you all. Everything will be posted to our respective YouTube channels and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.